Hey Spartans, before we get started in this week's show, just a quick apology about the audio quality. Someone, I'm not pointing any fingers at who edits the show, might be myself, lost the original audio for myself, so we've had to switch over to the Skype backup, so it's Skype quality audio, but at least David was able to find his Skype backup recording so we have some audio to give you so you will not miss out on the June news but apologies in advance that it does not sound like it normally does. Please enjoy. Thank you. This episode of Evolved is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped have all the tools for your manscaping needs like the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer and the Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer. Manscaped sent us their performance package 4.0 the uh, lawnmower actually looks great. I've been using it, keeping my face all nice and trimmed. I uh, use it in the shower. Thing's amazing. Works really quick. No complaints whatsoever. Yeah, I was actually really impressed with how it looks. It's quite stylish. It's small, it's black, it's nice. It has the LED light on it. It has two little guards that have like a double adjustment on each of them, so you get four different trimming lengths with it. A little charging dock that's USB C. I think it goes for 90 minutes on a full charge. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I love the charging dock. It's USB-C, like you said, and the whole the actual device is wireless. You just stick it in, you pick it up when you need it. It's it's great. It's it's super simple to use. The Weed Whacker, which is uh, for the nose, also is really awesome. I've been using it probably week, weekly at this point at my age. Uh, it works great. Nice and clean and neat and uh, no complaints from anyone. Yeah, no, I have only recently had to admit to hitting my mid-30s and needing a nose hair trimmer. This is the first one I've ever had. It's an interesting experience the first time you use one. I had very tickly. I sneezed once or twice. But it did the job. Things are trimmed. Things are tidy. It's styled similar to the lawnmower. It looks quite nice. It is not waterproof. Do not trim your nose hair in the shower. Very important. (laughs) Yes. That's a very, very important note. The set also includes their Crop Preserver Below the Waist Deodorant and Crop Reviver Below the Waist Toner, which both smell really good, I have to say. Yep, I can agree with you there. I sniffed them both, and they both smell excellent. Yeah, there's even a set of Manscaped boxers, and everything came in a nice little travel bag, which it has been really great. I've keeping all my Manscaped stuff in there. I'm going to be taking it with me on my vacation coming up here shortly. It's, it's really nice. Yep, the boxers seem very nice. Uh, I am now only a medium, and when I ordered this set, I was a large, so unfortunately they don't fit me particularly well, but they seem very nice, nice quality. Very impressed with the travel bag. It is now in my gym kit bag. It has permanent pride of place there. It's a very nice little travel bag, I have to say. I'm a sucker for little things like that. So if you've been thinking about upgrading your manscaping game, why not use the code evolved at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping and try some manscaped goodies today because your balls will thank you Spartans to Podcast Evolved, part of Evolved, your home for Halo. 
podcast evolved host original lore series and recaps the last month's halo news i'm your host aaron and with me today we've got david hello everybody we are here we are doing a show we are going to cover the monthly news from june some of it is good some of it is not good we will get to it as we go so as we have written here today we will cover stuff and stuff before we get started though we will do the socials this is podcast evolved you can check out all of our current lore series we've got infinite impressions we've also got our previous lore series the road to infinite and the character dossiers uh, you can find details on all of those over on the website evolvedhalo.com we also host a variety of other shows we've got mission debrief which just had a new episode i believe you guys covered the co-op yeah i managed to miss that episode unfortunately i couldn't make the recording but lucas filled in for me it was very nice for him so colin chris and lucas got a chance to play a bit of co-op and give their mission debrief impressions on it so go check it out it's an hour of goodness from the guys it'll probably be our last episode for a good while because we don't really have much plans past that now at the moment so i'm still toying with the idea that me and ian are going to hijack the series and do a gears of war co-op play we may just completely steal your show sure why not we need something to do and it's that or assassin's creed and there only is one assassin's creed co-op so like you know Whew, there's a lot there's a lot there though there's a lot there there is that that just becomes a new podcast series in its own right so we'll think about it we've also got builds with blocks hcs pro talk halo tv plus which also had a new updated episode recently it was on hiatus for a while between seasons it will be going dark again until season two of the show drops but keep an eye on that feed halo gear guide halo book club which is also currently on hiatus until the new book comes out in august and we have Halo Headlines, which I have not recorded the Halo Headlines in a while. I apologize. It just, not always a lot happening. Sometimes it's a bit negative and I just don't want to go and rant for 15 minutes, but we'll see. Maybe we'll record yeah. some again. Uh, yeah. Like I said, you can get all of our shows on the website, EvolvedHalo.com. If you're already a fan or listener, please go and rate us and leave us a review on your podcast service of choice. We appreciate all of the feedbacks. I'd also like to take a minute to thank all of our patrons for your continued support. Your contributions allow us to keep making everything we do here. Thank you very much, guys, honestly. Thanks, patrons. you the best. It's, no, they're pretty amazing bunch of people. So. It is. You guys give us money. You allow us to do what we do. I am currently ordering more equipment for myself. Uh, so like, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Otherwise, I'd have to buy it myself. So honestly, awesome. And it's always nice to have money in the fund to buy Lucas's next microphone. If you're not already subscribed, you can go and check out all of the rewards and benefits to becoming a patron, such as early access to episodes, unique swag, access to our podcast soundtrack, access to our newest exclusive podcast show, I Would Have Been Your Podcast, which is mostly turned into the me and Ian rant about stuff show. But, you know, if you would like to become a patron, go to patreon.com forward slash Halo Evolved where you can learn more. And then you can put in patron requests for things you'd like us to talk about on that show. And finally, we encourage all of our listeners to support us through Audible, where they can enjoy the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and much more. Use the trial URL, audibletrial.com forward slash podcast evolve to learn more and start your free trial today. I do not have an Audible recommendation this week, as I am still going through the Expanse series again. I am currently up to book seven of nine. Hey, Star Trek reference. So I uh, I have two credits. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself. You couldn't help No, I yourself. couldn't. I, say, I said it, and as soon as I realized <laughs> it, I had to say it. As soon as I finish this series, again, I will have to use my credits up. So if any listeners have a recommendation on an audiobook, drop it in. Drop us a voicemail. Drop us an email. Hit me up on Discord. I'm always looking for new things to try. I am open to suggestions. Right. Last week on Zeta Halo. So... I can cover mine really quickly. The only bit of Halo I played, I played two little bits. Uh, for last week's show, before I jumped on, I got on with Steve and we played a little bit. We dicked about in Forge. We played a game of Infection and we had a look at Scar. So that was last week. Played one game of Infection on Behemoth. It was fun, but you know when you start a new game mode and you're very confused? That was my whole game. How so? It's a standard infection mode, which makes sense, but the map is different. When you go, you know, when you run through Behemoth between like the two, the one forerunner structure in the middle, and there's like the underground level bit, you go down there now, and there's now two corridors that shoot off either side to the right. 
Do you know where the Warthog and oh, the Banshee they, spawn? I had read that they changed the maps. Yeah, Part so the map. where the yeah. where the Warthog and the Banshee spawn now, there's a hole in the ground under that, and you can drop down a shaft into this corridor that runs back into the center of the map. So there's one coming from either side, and there's certain areas are blocked off by crates, you know, so you've only maybe got one way in or out, or you've got to jump down off the bridge. It's just a little bit different. So I was running around, I was confused. I got taken out by a zombie. Then I was a zombie and I was confused because I had the translocator equipment and I didn't know how it worked yet. So I was also just very generally confused. But by the end of the game, I'd sort of figured it out a bit. It's standard enough infection, apart from a few little things as you go on. But I think it'd be a lot of fun with a few people you know. Infection's always more fun with a team of people you actually can coordinate with and have a bit of bit of a laugh with. Um, That's Halo in general. Life. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, played a bit of that, and then tonight I jumped on briefly while I was sorting the new stuff out and had a quick run about and fly about Forest in Forge as well. It's a beautiful map. It I really I do like it. Really like the look of this one. Yeah, I love the. It's like you said. I mean, it's Halo, Delta Halo, all over Halo Two. Sorry, Delta it, Halo. Bye. Yes massively strong delta halo vibes when you're sort of running around with that temple look and the big trees and i i do think that's a strong contender as a map i like i haven't played a game in it yet now i need to go and actually run around and try it out but just visually i find it a far far more appealing map than scar that that's the only two halo things i've done the i haven't played a lot of games lately i was off work for two weeks and i did very little xbox in that time apart from a little bit of Maneater. I got back into that briefly. What a game. What Maneater's a, game. a lot of fun. I quite enjoyed it. I ended up buying the DLC because I share Game Pass with oh. a friend. So they started to play a Maneater. They wanted the DLC. So I was like, tell you what, I'll buy it in my account because then we both get it. And nice. playing away at it. And just, I was sort of in the like the mopping up mission stage before the big final DLC fight. And I got a bit bored. So I stopped for a while. And then I happened to pick up a uh, snow runner again. So I've spent my last week on and off just like casually chilling, playing a bit of snow runner. What's snow runner? It is the sequel to, do you remember mud runner? The like off road driving game where you're like moving trucks across sort no. of like the American, it's like the U S wilderness and you know, you're moving like logging trucks about and Jeeps and exploring no. and, it's just little missions. It'll be like tow a trailer from here to here or move logs from this tum- the lumber mill to somewhere else or whatever. But it's made by Focus, so expect the same vibe as like farming simulator and things like that. Just mucky and muddy and slippy and you've got to use your winch slots. Fair enough. So I've just been sort of playing that because it's a nice chill sort of I'm going to spend an hour and I'm going to drag a semi-trailer across a map and that's going to be it. And then I'm just going to turn it off and go on because... Sometimes I don't want to deal with people. I uh, understand the sentiment. Yeah, so that's been all of my gaming. I don't think I've done anything else. Apart from that, it's just been real life things like hanging out with people and going places. That's loud. Yeah. This is encouraged. Have you done any gaming? I have done a bit of gaming. Uh, I've been pretty obsessed. Uh, I, I've been looking at... I'm not a Souls player. I, I've tried them in the past, never really talked to them. Um, there's a few of the Souls-like games that I've actually really taken to and loved. Like, I loved Jedi Fallen Order, and I loved... Um, there's another one out there that's like it. I can't really remember. Lords of Fallen, that came out years ago. That was my first one that I actually managed to play that one to to its end. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this format, the way, the way that was done. So I bought this game called Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. I remember when it was coming out... They had said from software made a series of games in the past that I was obsessed with and loved called Tenchu, stealth ninja killy games. And they're on the original PlayStation. And I think they originally, they did come to Xbox eventually. And one game came out for 360, but it wasn't amazing. But I love the older ones. And I heard that they were making a new one and I got very excited. Then they went, oh no, we're going to make it into a Souls game. So they turned what Tenchu, that new Tenchu into Sekiro. And I was like super pissed off. And I was like, God damn bastards. They turned it into a game I can't play. So then it came out and it was amazing and the whole world loved it. And I was like, God damn it. And then my brother became obsessed with it. So about two years ago, I bought it when it was on sale. And I bought it on disc and I did nothing with it. I was just like, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And I didn't never went near it. 
So my brother was visiting last month and we got talking about games and stuff like that and he was still talking about Sekiro and I was like, all right, okay. So I started it and fucking hell, did it just take hold of me. It was all I did for the last month was just play Sekiro over and over and over again. Banging my head against the wall, trying to beat the bosses, reading Wikipedias. Oh my God, I fell into a rabbit hole with that game. I just loved it. Uh, I finished it. I went straight into New Game Plus, kept going, kept going. And I've stopped now because I need to do other things in my life. Um, but that really, really took a hold of me, that game. Just such a well-made game, fucking hell. Just so much fun. And after that, I was like, I need to play Tenchu. It's in my, it's just in my body. And I have all my old 360 games. So I went up to the box in my room, spare room, um, my dumping ground room. And dug out my Halo Reach Xbox 360, connected it up to my TV, connected it up to the internet, and just to see what was on it. I haven't looked at it in years. A bunch of fun games still on there. I still had Halo Reach installed, which was kind of fun. And Halo Waypoint, do you remember that? That, like, gaming app function thing that they had. Oh, yeah, the five yeah. brief minutes. They had that, the predecessor to the website. Yes, yes, yes. And I was like, oh, this is funny. And then I put in Tenchu. And it's terrible. It did not hold up. Oh, man, the controls are real rough. And that made me really sad. But I have my 360 installed now, so I'll probably do something else with it at some stage. I'm eyeing up Batman Arkham Origins because that can't be played on Xbox One. So I'm like, that might be my next gaming event. I think I might sit down and tackle that fella again because I haven't played that since it came out. I love that game. So there you are, and that's everything. Oh, and playing Division 1 again with my brother. So my youngest brother has moved to uh, Lithuania, and our kind of way of keeping touch now has turned into the Division 1. So it's been pretty fun rolling a new character and going back into Division 1. Still a great-looking game. Plays real well. They've still updated it. It's got loads of support still, uh, which is really impressive. We just went into the Dark Zone for the first time this week, which was pretty fun because it's different than I remember it. A lot more, it seems to be populated, they seem to have populated it now more with AI characters than I remember and other kind of live events that go on in there. Didn't see anyone else playing, so it might have just been me and my brother. So I kept, we kept waiting to find this crazy level 30 dude to come in and look and wreck our wreck shop, but we never found him. That's fun. That's- that's probably my nephew because I'd say he's the only other person roaming around Division One. I'm wondering is that why they've stuck <laughs> the AI and it's like people aren't playing this like versus mode anymore. We need bots. We need something for people to shoot. Yeah, there seems there seems to be way more than I remember going on in there, but which is good to be honest that they populated it like that because it's pretty fun. So I've been enjoying that. So that's kind of what I've been doing gaming wise. It's not too bad. I think that's fairly productive. Um, we don't have to play Halo all of the time. This sure. isn't like it's a Halo podcast or anything. What would we need to do that <laughs> for? Totally don't need to. Uh, fair enough. I think that's enough for us. Right. We'll dive into this month's Halo news. Let's do it. Okay. So up in the news, first we have a Forge overview for Season 4. Now, we basically did a brief early impressions episode last week of season four so i won't get too stuck into this because me and steve have talked about it and when we get nate rounded up again for another forge finds episode we will cover more of this stuff in detail but the short version is we finally got a static water plane so like you can have a puddle a sea a lake whatever you need you can have water they have a few before and after pictures of chasm with and without water we are getting more Forerunner objects. We are now getting universal blockers. And if you're going, what does that sound like? Basically, you can have areas or like walls or whatever to mark out no vehicles, no bullets, no people. Rather than having to put individual ones in now, you can just put a universal one in. Handy if you don't want anything going out of your map or into a certain area or whatever. They've now made a mini game mode, which is just a blank mode to allow Forge players to set up whatever they need. They're improving the way that the budget is displayed for your parts and pieces and AI and everything else. And they are doing VFX improvements as well. So no doubt we will cover those in more detail in the next Forge Finds. We are going to wait a few weeks. I'd say probably at the end of July we will do one because that will give the community enough time to 
get their hands around the new update and make some cool shit. So expect an episode probably the end of this month. Okay, we also have the four pieces of the Story Shard Precipice now available. I will organize an Infinite Impressions episode where we will cover that lore. It's the four-part Sloan series and what the Banished have been up to. We the will, created, we get... you mean? Oh, the created, not the Banished. Yes, uh, I completely forgot about that other enemy. Just like 343. Yay! Hey. So we will cover that in an Impressions episode. Not really a book, so it's not really a book club. So we will continue after that. We got an overview of infection. So like we've talked about it there for a little bit. There's not a lot to say. It goes as follows. The theme this time around is Iritus and an AI infection. Is, whereas you may remember in the likes of Halo 5 and that, it was a flood-themed infection mode. We have a specific look for both the alpha and the beta zombies. Uh, I think you get three alpha zombies at the start of a match, so they have a more enhanced look with the sort of holographic overlay on their helmet and suit and stuff, and then the beta zombies get a bit less. There are infection-specific map variants. Like I said, the only one I came across and played was Behemoth, but it was quite different to standard Behemoth. We also get fairly standard infection rules. I can't remember if this applied for any others, but Last Spartan Standing gets Overshield and Infinite Ammo. So I have seen oh, a I couple of that. videos. That's yeah, cool. I think this might be new. Right, Me and Steve talked about this as well, but if you can save the turret until the last man standing, you are living your best Arnold Schwarzenegger dream. I've seen videos of people on... <laughs> That's cool. I saw a video of a guy on Forest, and he was sort of backed into the corner near the cliff, so he had like two lines of sight, and he's just dropping the infected as they come at him all the time. That's pretty cool. I think that was my... I, I said this in the last episode, but the single best game of infection I ever had was back in Halo 3, and it was on the pit. And I was lucky enough to grab the turret off one of the platforms and make it up to the top center room. I think that's the room that the sword spawns in. And one side of the corridor around it was blocked off with crates so the infected could only come around the far side. So I sat at the end with my back to the crates and just every time one of them appeared around the corner, spread them with the turret. But if I had have had infinite ammo on my turret, it would have been amazing because I just wouldn't have needed to do absolutely anything. Just sit with my finger on the trigger and wait to the end of the match. That would be quite cool. With this season, we got two new maps, so I think I've mentioned both of them. We got Scar, which is a Banished-themed sort of facility base map. Uh, we'll have some lore in it later. It's quite dark. It's molten lava. There's a sky train. It's a nice map. It just doesn't visually grab me, whereas the other map is Forest. It is an ancient temple complex, and I think it's beautiful. We also get an overview for the Season 4 customization. As standard, we have a new Battle Pass. It is 100 tiers. There is 180 items. It is 2,800 credits for the Premium Pass. We get a new Hazmat Core. We get more weapon models. So the one that they said, I think when you start the pass, you get the Flash Blind Kit for the Assault Rifle, and there's one or two others. And they're talking about more with time because... The weapon models is a very underused section in these. I was hoping, like, way back at the start, we were going to get a lot of options for this, but we don't, which is kind of weird, because a lot of games do it. And it would be very nice if you could uh, get, you know, weapon kit models for all of the variations of the assault rifle, and then maybe, like, funky cool looking stuff, like, if you could have a forerunner take on the assault rifle would be cool. Like, I don't yeah, know why you don't have this sort of thing. So underutilized, so it's obviously taking them a long time to get around to doing this. Like, I was kind of hoping it would give us things like, say, the old shotgun model for the yeah. current shotgun. Like, little things like that that you could change up completely would be cool. Hopefully we get a bit more of that as time goes on. We also have a series of events coming up this season. So we will have Hazmat and Containment. That will be running July 27th for two weeks, so till July 11th and August 29th till September 12th. Each of those weeks or two week sessions will offer a 10 tier reward path for hazmat stuff. We will also get 10 ride two and three. Each of those will be a two week event. Each of those will have a 10 tier pass as well. The first one will start July 18th. The second one will start September 19th. 
And then we get a Cyber Showdown 2 in the middle of it all. And that is a two-week event with a 10-tier pass. And that will be on August 8th. So, like, actually a pretty packed schedule for events. Now that, like, the season's a bit tighter, it's nice to see that we're not, like, getting one event every four weeks. Yeah, there seems to be a good bit in there. Not really following it, but, like, they're still doing stuff. I mean, when I was building the script and looking at it, I mean, I was like, oh, there's, there's a good bit going on still. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I've missed a lot of these events. I haven't been playing them. I would need a non-PVP way to, like, it would have been nice if there was a... If there had have been a Warzone mode that would have allowed me to make progress in these, that probably would have interested me a bit more. But but they're still there, and they're pretty well packed in there, so that's not too bad. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 more items for your various cores and stuff, so not too bad. Right, we also have some news on the armor cores and stuff. So the 343 have said, all armor and weapon coatings new to Season 4 from the Premium Battle Pass and the shop will include versions for all armor cores and weapons. This is the start of the sort of universal item. This season, each new Premium coating for specific armor core or weapon is represented as an individual item due to the way the current store operates. That's a little bit of a pain. In future seasons, we expect this to be more streamlined with a single coding icon item being able to accommodate all applicable models. That seems like a simple ask. You get one armor coding, you don't need to see 10 versions of it because you just know you have one armor coding that appears everywhere. The same with a weapon skin. You get one weapon skin, it should be available for every weapon. I don't need to see the assault rifle variant, the BR variant the pistol variant so hopefully that, that gets sense. ironed out in the next season but for now that's the way it'll work they are also continuing the trend of super bundles so these will be a bundle made up of three smaller bundles plus exclusive content and the uh, the aim for them is that it'll work out cheaper to buy the super bundle than individually so they said that the hazmat haven bundle it'll contain three full bundles that can be purchased individually so it'll be a courier for 1600 credits Toolmaster, 1,400 credits, and Warning Signs for 1,500 credits. 1,500 credits. Quite steep, I think, those prices for a bundle, but people must be paying for it. And it additionally includes an exclusive Mythic Effect set and Weapon Charm. Purchased individually, each bundle adds up to 4,500 credits, but when purchased together as part of the Super Bundle, it'll be 3,400 credits. Players save 1,100 credits, and it's a 24% discount. So... If you had your eye on any of those, you can buy it as a set. And then it says that the other bundle available this season will be July 18th. It'll be with the return of the Tenrai event, and it'll be the Dragonborn Dragonborn bundle, and it'll be available, same sort of rules. I think it also says after you buy one of the sub-bundles, when you go back to the store, it will make you an offer to buy the super bundle with a discount so that you don't pay for that bundle twice. So if you've bought any one of the three, good. it will then give you the option to go in for the rest. That seems not That's too bad, at least. least. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to buy one or have bought one and then be locked out of the Super Bundle to get the rest. So I, I think that's okay. And then you're going to take us through the cannon fodder. Yes. So the most recent cannon fodder called System Shocks, which is interesting, given the fact that System Shock Remake was released recently. If you were following that old school game, it's pretty cool. Here we have, we have some map lore that they put in for the two new maps. So Scar, which is a banished king. So it says, after their induction into the Covenant, the Jirohane were often settled on resource-rich worlds, such worlds as a deterrent to some of the more ambitious client species. In the aftermath of their Covenant War, these worlds became another part of the alien Hemogenes carcass to be claimed by eager hands as many of the dormant master packs lacked the knowledge and means to exploit the worlds given to them. While some packs sought to use their holdings as leverage against humanity and their former allies, most simply looted what they could off the Covenant inheritance. Atriox's emergence and rapid expansion of his banished war machine brought with it an endless hunger for raw materials. His loyal forces and allies soon deployed powerful excavators, extractors, and harvesters to these worlds, destroying any packs who resisted and absorbing the rest. And then we have Forest, 
Since it was briefly explored as part of Operation Grey Veil vale in, in 2544, in which an ODST fire team and a Spartan II super soldier were sent to assassinate a Covenant prophet. Ooh, I know what this is. The world of Hian was fa has fascinated only analysts and its researchers. Its ancient runes have defiled attempts to categorize them, though there are clear elements of forerunner architecture in the largest assemblages. Post-war exploration was tented under Project Bookworm, which we remember, oh, we should remember that too, through only superficial exploration has been conducted to date. Nevertheless, tantalizing new clues have emerged from the he and field teams who remained behind during the created uprising, which points the Office of Naval Intelligence to questions which concern humanity's spacefaring ancestors and the true nature of their connection with the Forerunners. So that's really interesting because that's talking about a Halo Legends short, which was, uh, what was that? It's the name the of that babysitter, isn't it? The, the babysitter. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That is Daisy, isn't it? I mean, maybe it is Daisy. Maybe it is. Hang on. I looked this up while we were talking. Yeah. But that was one of my favorite Halo Legends. That was a really cool short. I really enjoyed that when they were assassinating. And obviously Project Bookworm was the one where they were trying to create a trap essentially for a foreigner AI. I think they were trying to capture three four three guilty spark in it and stuff like that. So that came out in some of my Kelly Gay's short uh, stories. Anyway, but that's cool. I really enjoyed that. That's cool. And then like the cannon fodder then goes off there, what we just said where they're talking about the true nature of human ancient humans connection to the foreigners with a whole bunch of collections of different lores in different places. Stuff about like from Halo Evolution short stories from the office of Dr. William Arthur, a Halo, Halo Primordium, all the different kind of blurbs that kind of hint at humanity's origins. So it's pretty interesting. So stuff from Salendium, I won't read them all out, but um, it's worth to go checking out to see all of these things put in one place to try hint at, hinting at maybe was Earth the actual origin of humanity and what is our link to ancient forerunners considering the fact that the librarian was born with human-like features that kind of set her apart. And a lot of it became like her kind of journey into figuring out where she came from and stuff. So that's kind of interesting. Sorry, I was going to cut in with a lower update so that people aren't screaming at us right now. The Spartan in The Babysitter is Cal141. She is the Cal. blonde Spartan. And Daisy is, I forgot, she's actually in Homecoming. That's oh, the she goes back and look at herself she's... and then kills herself. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's where we got confused. Just in case you're writing a very angry lower email right now, yeah. you can you can put the keyboard down. I've learned my lesson. Then there's a bunch of hazmat lore off the new hazmat kind of suits, which is kind of interesting uh, in the kind of suits origins and the usage and stuff like that. Then there was the quantum lore locator. So it's stuff about the two new pieces of gear that we have and having you know, the Tress Seeker and the quantum locator, what's it called? Yeah, this little space translocator, little quantum marker thingy. And having read about both of them, I still struggle to understand what they do. I can give you a quick rundown because I did this in the last episode. So the threat seeker, it's similar to the threat sensor. You shoot it as a piece of equipment, except it'll bounce once. And then I'd say about a second after the bounce, it detonates. And when it detonates, any enemy within line of sight of the detonation point is highlighted in red. So it doesn't go through walls or anything, but it just like flips out in a big spear or a big sphere, similar to the threat sensor. But it highlights everyone. And then for about four seconds, you can see all of the enemy Spartans that it highlights. So it doesn't matter where they go. So if you had Spartans around a corner, you in theory could shoot this, it'll ricochet around the corner, detonate, highlight them, and then every player in your team on the map can see those Spartans for four seconds. Unlike okay. the threat sensor, where you tag it on a point and anyone that passes through it is highlighted while they're in the sphere of effect, this will work anywhere. So if you were driving along in a Warthog and this detonated beside you, as you cruise on in the Warthog, you will be visible for four seconds to the enemy. Oh, interesting. Okay. The best way to describe the trans quantum locator thingy my bob is it's what the prometheans use in halo 4 that's the way to describe it you know that quick like teleport oh yeah that's basically how that works you activate it and you tag one point and then you run on and when you activate it again you will teleport back to that point and then you can sort of 
as it cools down again, it takes like a second to cool down, then you can teleport back to the point you left from. So you basically just like juke back and forth between these two points. I tested it out a couple of times. It's quite cool, but there's enough of a cooldown on it that you can't abuse it. Like you can't just keep appearing and disappearing at will. But it lasts a reasonable length of time. I say you'd get four, maybe five teleports out of it before it like expires. But say, yeah, you say you're running along, you tag a point on a cliff, and then you jump off the cliff. You can teleport back to that point. The only problem then is you would then teleport back off the cliff when you hit the button again, and there's not enough cooldown for you to get back. You know, it has its uses. We were sort of playing about with it. And one of the things I noticed was, like, say, when we were playing Infection on Behemoth, you would tag it at the top of the shaft, jump down the hole, fall to the bottom, and activate it. So you would shoot back up the shaft, and the enemy players would be like, oh, where's he gone? And then if someone distracts them from the far side quickly, you immediately teleport back down behind the enemy and can attack them. So yeah. it's just like a sort of zip back and forth between two points, but it's very much reminiscent of how the knights do it in Halo 4. I think that's like the best way to think of it. That's a really um, interesting thing. That sounds cool. But it's a sort of, it's a short term between two points. So that's the only catch to it really. But it's interesting. I could see like some cool stuff happening with big players. I did see one of the most amazing videos on TikTok where someone, or it might've been Reddit, Someone used the translocate and they teleported back at the exact moment that a Spartan ran through their teleportation point and they vaporized them. Oh damn! So they they ah. actually scored. They scored a kill with their teleport, and I thought, oh, that's cool. Imagine the fun things you could do. I I don't know if it would affect a vehicle, but imagine if you teleported back to a spot as a warthog or something drove through it and you just like killed everyone on it. That's ridiculous, but that's, that's cool. So I like that. I think there'll be some good potential with that. The Threat Seeker, I think the biggest problem, as we talked about it with the Threat Seeker, is I wish it was like the grenade launcher in Reach. I wish you could launch it, let it ricochet, and hold the trigger or the, or the uh, equipment button down and not let it activate until you wanted to because that's the only thing it's missing. I think the, if you launch it up in the air and it rebounds off the roof, it detonates almost at the roof so it's not much use to you you know you kind of want to be able to launch it and let it detonate when you want it to that's the only complaint i have about it or the only thing i wish was different and that's basically the two of them that's pretty cool okay thanks for that there's a whole bunch of stuff then in the kind of thought about precipice which we won't touch on because it's already there so it's pretty much saying which part of precipice is canon slash not canon so precipice is obviously about like uh, ai talking to each other and having a simulation ongoing so what happens in the simulation in the simulation is not canon but the fact that there is a simulation running is canon if that makes sense so that's kind of just they're just wrapping that up and talking a little bit about the assembly which is interesting because that's way back in halo reach stuff about these kind of secret ais that were helping humanity in the background but being very quiet and sneaky about it. So obviously they're like kind of at odds with what the creator is doing. So it's kind of like how these two f- factions essentially meet and how they interact, which is interesting. Then they touch off, obviously there is new infection intel. So there's the first one is there. It's obviously about Erathus just claiming how much happy he is going through and categorizing all of the Spartan lore and stuff like that and access to information that he has now as he's infecting and taking over our suits. And they touched on the fact that Halo Outcast, which is out on August 8th, they're going to release some of the early chapters beforehand in the next coming month. I will not be reading those, but they will be there. They did the same thing for Rubicon Protocol last year. And that's they've kind done of it for the kind of last, order. yeah. They've done that for the last couple of audio or books. They've done like maybe a chapter, a section of audiobook and yeah. a few bits in advance. It, I'll probably be the same as you. I will not look at them beforehand because I just want to get stuck into the book. But if you can't like control yourself, usually worth a bit of a look. I think the best ones yeah, they ever did not. was Silent Storm and that because they got Steve Downs to narrate those. And oh, that's the, cool. That's really yeah, the, those book. little like yeah. pre-release chapters. I think for Silent Storm and what was the other, the second one? Uh, Oblivion. Oblivion, yeah, they. I think they got him to do a chapter for both of those, and you're like, I wish we had a Steve Downs narrated audiobook. That would be so cool. That will come someday, I'll tell you, I reckon. Hopefully, or we just get his like AI generated voice to do it for us. Might happen someday, Aaron. Might happen. Oh, fingers crossed. Right, we have one more bit of slightly more depressing news. 
You kind of uh, popped this, didn't you? But you, who felt, you saw yeah, this? Yeah, I, I, I think I spotted this on Reddit. There was a bit of a, an uproar. Well, there were a couple of uproars. One of them was finding out that the, the new Spar- Dead Spartan props for Forge have color customization, which the players don't have. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. So yeah, you can you can color customize the dead Spartan props the way you could in older Halo games, but you can't do that with your own character. It was kind of funny, kind of sad. But anyway, this was the other one that caught my eye was Power Halo basically said that the season four narrative cutscenes have been cut from Halo Infinite, which you will notice when you launch the game. There is no there's no cutscenes at all. Now I did see a couple of people mentioning that since the cutscenes have been cut. There was an issue where settings were resetting every time you launched the game, and that has stopped. So they think the two things are related somehow. But there's a post here from Sketch on Twitter that says, PSA, as we've refined our top priorities and shifted resources internally this year, we had to make the decision to forgo seasonal narrative cutscenes to make room for the team to continue focusing on highly requested features, content, and improvements for Halo Infinite. These trade-offs are never easy to make, and we truly appreciate your support as a team, as the team works to make Halo Infinite the best experience possible. While the job is far from over, Season 4 marks another big step forward, and we remain committed to the journey with Halo Infinite and the community. And I'm like, on the one hand, I kind of get it, because I I can't tell how many people are still at 343. I talked about this with Ian on the last I Would Have Been Your uh, podcast episode, he was on holidays and happened to get talking to another person on holidays who turned out to be a guy that worked at uh, one of the Call of Duty studios. And they were just talking about oh, like general gaming stuff and all the rest. And they said one of the little facts he had dropped was that they're getting a lot of job applications from former 343 staff. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. So there have been a lot of layoffs and a lot of things going on. And I just... It, this makes me sad and does not fill me with much confidence. No, it's a bit of a bummer, but it does make sense that anyway, with the fact that they've so many contracts just being cut loose now and so many of the even higher ups leaving 343. That that all makes sense. And one of the things that they've said, it was in one of the posts I read, they're obviously they're doing anything called game isolation. So like when you boot up Halo Infinite now, you boot, actually boot up the multiplayer first because they want they want to segregate the multiplayer from the campaign for doing updates so like when you boot up the campaign then from the main menu you're actually booting up a different instance of halo infinite which is kind of interesting so that was kind of their kind of like one of the things they're doing obviously to make their updates easier and quicker to make and implement so i thought that was quite interesting so like things so like a warthog could be updated in multiplayer and that won't impact campaign in any way yeah, it is. It's just sort of disappointing that we're not going to get any more like this. There wasn't a lot to the story stuff in the cutscenes because unlike something like Destiny, it didn't then translate into the game. Like I I really would have loved if all these cutscenes we got in season three with Din and Eritus and all the rest had have translated to a mission the way Destiny does. Something it. in the campaign. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah that way, like, it's like it's you know, one of those like we're, we're, we're talking about Spartan Ops. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. Really- like, that's yeah, really what it was. You would have gone into the map on the, what do they call it, the Avery Johnson facility. Like, you would have gone down that shaft. You would have fought enemies. You would have made your way to Earth as you would have done something. Like, I really wish we had a little bit of that. Like, even if you only had to do it the once, but you get no real in-game anything. And then, like, you load this season up. You don't get a cutscene. But the background image, when you load the game in, is Din and your Spartan standing in front of what is clearly like an empty suit of Spartan armor that Eritus has taken control of. And you're like, like, there's probably something cool to go with this, but now it'll just be like a chapter and waypoint. And how many people will see it? It'll be the same problem that the first Destiny had where everything was a fucking lore card. Uh, A Grimoire card. Wasn't that what we had in first Destiny? Oh, yeah. The Grimoire cards. Yep, and no one ever read those. No one cared. No one went to the website of the app. I was just like, what's the lore for this? Oh, there's really cool lore if you go and look. No, I'm out. And that's just like, I don't know. I'm just a bit disheartened these days with the whole thing. I mean, it says we're not getting Halo Infinite DLC single player. Like, that's just straight up not happening. We're getting the multiplayer updates from 343, and that's probably all we're going to get support-wise. We're going to have to wait many, many years for the next game. Um, Plus, whatever Star Infinity is doing. 
all of my hopes now rest yeah. on whatever certain affinity is doing to give us like something for the next few years. So, but I reckon I that's know. a multiplayer thing. Well, like whatever that is, will be multiplayer, you know. Yeah, I'm just hoping it's got a PVE mode in it. That's that's really all yeah. I'm sort of like waiting for at this point. I just want some PVE that I can do with friends. But uh, a war zone. Give us a war zone type. Yep, thing, yeah. just yep. a war zone firefight type thing would be nice. So we will we will have to see. But who knows? We will we will keep you posted as we hear stuff or see stuff. Right. So that's all of our news anyway. We don't have anything else terribly exciting on that front. Uh, we have a little evolved digest stuff, and then that will be us for for the minute. So let's see what we've got. In the digest, we have the podcast evolved slash infinite impressions. Our last impressions episode will be the season four initial impressions. And then the next impressions episode will be the lore for last season. So that's going to be the, uh, what were we calling that? Uh, Precipice. That'll be that lore. We will cover that on the next episode. Mission Debrief, like we said, our last episode then was Co-op Impressions with Krista, Colin and Lucas. The next episode will be either a Gears of War Co-op playthrough or someday, by some miracle, more Halo content. Until then, it is on temporary hold until we get something. Halo Book Club then, our last book club was Winter Contention. That was the short story on Waypoint that officially marked us as up to date. So the next book club you get will be in August with the release of the next novel, Outcasts. So August 8th, and then sometime after that, we will get the the book club to you. And that will be us then. Officially, there's no more... There's no more books until next year. The next novel is now January 2024. So unless something else comes up in the meantime or we get another winter contention style waypoint story, that's us for now. So Halo Bet Waypoint will just be waiting patiently. We also have HCS Pro Talk. And each week, Josh and Will discuss the latest information within the comp- Halo competitive scene with an emphasis on the community. I believe there's HCS stuff on as we speak. I had... Uh, Twitch running in the background earlier because Steve told me there's some nice skins going for that so I will go and look for those later next up you're going to hear from Josh and Will about what's been happening in June with HCS over to you guys hello podcast evolved audience and welcome to inside HCS your monthly recap of all things Halo esports presented by us not other than HCS Pro Talk your weekly Halo esports podcast for this segment we'll be recapping the HCS news and competition from the month of June 2023 but before we get into the recap, let's begin with a little introduction to what exactly is the HCS. The HCS or Halo Championship Series is the umbrella in which all Halo competition lives under. The 2023 HCS season has already begun, with regular online and land competition happening all throughout the year. And for all major announcements from the HCS team over at 343, please make sure to follow their Twitter account at HCS and their official YouTube channel by searching for Halo Esports. Just one piece of news for you that, well, I guess bigger news that happened over the course of the last month, and that is that tickets for HGS Fort Worth and the Halo World Championship are available right now. Both in the general admission and VIP variety, they obviously range in price as well. Um, No per-day ticket sales are available at this current time, so it's for full three-day passes. Again, for the HGS Fort Worth Major and the World Championship, those tickets are available right now now and uh they're on eventbrite so if you're interested go to eventbrite and check that out as for tournament highlights we have the hcs arlington major that happened um over the past month and just some highlights for you here optic were eliminated with the top five six placing at their own home event when i personally had them taking first so that's fucking insane Quadrant made international Halo history two times during the weekend with a top three finish. FaZe swept Space Station in the Grand Finals 4-0. Oh, Oh, yeah. And from a spectator perspective, the event was fucking awful. For all the dirty details, make sure you listen to both episodes 294 and 295 of HCS Pro Talk. They are parts one and two of our HCS Arlington post-show. As for looking ahead, we have the HCS Global Invitational presented by Space Station Gaming, the qualifiers for said event. The HCS has officially entered split two of the season, which means the competition is only getting stronger. These qualifiers will determine the teams advancing to compete in Salt Lake City, Utah at the beginning of August. 
So stay tuned for all of those happening throughout the month of July, that is, this month. Because, obviously. And uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside HDS for June 2023. If you're interested in finding out more about these tournaments or anything else in the competitive Halo space, please check out HDS Pro Talk on all socials, YouTube, Twitch, and anywhere you happen to find your podcasts. Podcast Evolve Crew, take it away. Thank you, Josh and Will, for this month's Inside the HCS. Watch the show live Monday nights around 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central on twitch.tv forward slash HCS Pro Talk. Follow them on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed. All right, guys, I think that will do us then for another week. Thank you for joining us. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, find every episode of everything we do on the website, EvolvedHalo.com. If you want to listen to everything all in one place, look for Halo Podcast Evolved on your podcast service of choice. Once again, a special shout out to all of our patrons for your continued support. You guys help make everything possible. Go to patreon.com forward slash Halo Evolve to learn more and become a subscriber today. And finally, if you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode, any other episode, I would have been your podcast, whatever you want, you can do that by calling the number 205 Evolved. That's 205-386-5833. And with that, I have been your host, Aaron. And until next time, Evolved. Evolved! I don't know why I read the blank space and I froze my, what's your name? <laughs> I just saw it and I went, what's your name? Say it out loud. That's fine. Oh.